We're going to be talking about Mary this week. So last module, we looked at Jesus uh, and his death and resurrection. And really from uh, the last three modules, we've really looked at the Paschal mystery, uh, who Jesus was, his life, his death, and his resurrection. I want to conclude this unit on Jesus by looking at Mary. So why Mary? Well, for a couple of reasons. Uh, St. Louis de Montefort, a famous saint uh, in Catholic history, once uh, wrote about how to get to Jesus, we can do so through Mary. Uh, and that's one of the reasons it's just like Jesus reveals who God the Father is, because Jesus was born of Mary, we can learn about a lot about Jesus through the person of Mary. We can also learn a lot about how to follow Jesus by Mary's example. So we're going to spend a little bit of, of this uh, module looking at who Mary is and what that might show about who Jesus is and how we can follow. Uh, and then once we finish this, um, this uh, uh, module will be done with the unit and on to our assessment. So let's get started. So who was Mary first? Well, what little we do know of Mary comes from scripture and we comes from uh, tradition. Uh, so tradition shares that Mary was a teenage girl, uh, anywhere between the ages of 14 and 16. So she might have been around actually your age uh, if you're in high school. Uh, so consider that when we're going through this module. We believe that she lived in Nazareth, which was in northern Israel, uh, which at the time was a small village, only maybe of a couple hundred people. If that, today Nazareth has swelled to several thousand. She was a devout Jew. So her parents, uh, who we now know as St. Joachim and St. Anne, uh, were devout Jews, practicing Jews. So Mary, we believe, would have been a devout and practicing Jew. We also believe from scripture and tradition that she was poor from the lower class. So her family were, were probably farmers in some regard uh, or had some kind of trade to make a living. And that's, and that's how they got by. Uh, we also know that at the time of her conception of Jesus, that she was an engaged to a man named Joseph, who scripture shares with us uh, or paints an image of is a carpenter. Uh, so again, we're looking at Mary and Joseph as working class, poor class, uh, devout Jews. That's kind of the image that we're getting of these historical individuals. Well, let's look in scripture. What is scripture kind of share about mary so mary pops up sporadically but when she does it's important again the gospels were focused on the person of jesus uh, but the fact that certain individuals pop up are, are really important and the reason being is you don't see specific individuals in the gospels referred to consistently other than jesus uh, really the only people who get consistent shout outs at, by name are peter and Mary, so Mary being the mother of Jesus and Peter, who we believe would go on to be the leader of the apostles and the first pope. So that kind of says something. If you're if you're referenced more than once, several times, then you kind of play a key role in the story. So that Mary is referenced more than once by name is is pretty important, even though she's not showing up in every in every scene. The first time we kind of see of Mary in the Gospels is at the Annunciation. Uh, so we see the Annunciation being when uh, the angel Gabriel came down. To Mary and asked her to be the mother of Jesus uh, and Mary's beautiful response of I am the handmaid of the Lord I aka I'm God's servant and I will do what he will so her yes what we call in Latin her fiat her act of faith uh, to God even though she's a 14 15 16 year old girl engaged and all of a sudden she's going to be pregnant not with Joseph's child talk about that for drama uh, and somehow she has to explain oh Joseph it's God's child think about today how well that will go over the confidence that had to take to say yes to have that role in God's plan is astounding so that's the enunciation next we uh, see Mary visiting her cousin Elizabeth uh, uh, at, during her pregnancy, and that's when we, we kind of see this exchange of Elizabeth uh, reaching, Mar uh, hearing Mary and saying, blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. So fun fact, actually where we get the first half of the prayer of the Hail Mary comes from these two encounters. So Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee, is the angel's greeting to Mary uh, in the Gospels. And Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, is uh, St. Elizabeth's greeting uh, to Mary in the Gospels. So really, the prayer of uh, the Hail Mary is a very scriptural-based prayer. Well, after the visitation, 
uh, we the next time we see Mary upon her return, uh, there's this kind of back and forth with Joseph that uh, she's afraid that uh, she will be stoned because according to Mosaic law, uh, if you are caught in adultery, uh, you were stoned uh, to death. Uh, but Joseph, being a righteous man, does not uh, ask for that. But an angel comes in a dream, tells uh, Joseph that what Mary is saying is true, and then Joseph believes. And so they kind of go on, and we move on to Jesus' birth. And Mary sees some unexpected visitors, uh, and we see how she keeps all these things. As scripture says she keeps all these things in her heart. So basically, she she's internalizing everything she's seeing. Can you imagine this 14, 15, 16 year old girl, and all these amazing things happen? You're processing this, be like, wow, this child really is what this angel said it. it this child is going to be. We see the temple purification where Mary is going to be revealed as someone who will suffer for Jesus' work by the prophet Simeon and Anna who meet Jesus. Simeon was a righteous man who God promised would not see death until uh, he saw uh, his uh, savior, Jesus. And he kind of prophesizes to Mary and saying that uh, Jesus would be the cause of the rise and fall of many in Israel and that a sword would pierce Mary's heart. So she would have to suffer greatly, pointing to the fact of Jesus' suffering servant in his passion and death to come. During Jesus' ministry, Mary doesn't pop up a lot. There's one instance where she does is said that she comes with family uh, to uh, to kind of speak with Jesus. Uh, some speculate because they didn't know, uh, they didn't fully understand the ministry that he was doing, so to kind of reel him back in. Others to see him because he was traveling. But at the very least, regardless of how it's interpreted, it shows that she has this curiosity uh, for Jesus' uh, ministry. We also, the big instance in what you're asked to read and reflect upon in some of the modules materials is the wedding at Cana. And for me, I really think that the wedding at Cana personifies uh, what, how Mary and Jesus' relationship work. And we're going to look at that in a second. But in essence, we see her as the mediator, this conduit, uh, this go-between that helps his first miracle to occur. And lastly, we see at the cross, she's a silent witness. She doesn't speak but she's there as a testimony that she doesn't leave her son, even in the thick and thin, she's there with him. And so we can kind of learn from this too, you know, how can we say yes to God, when, even when we feel like God is asking some difficult things of us? How can even in the unexpected moments of life be able to trust in God and maybe to see what God is doing in our lives? Uh, how can we maybe take on the fact that if we follow God and accept this plan, we might have to suffer? Uh, how can we be a conduit to help other people come to know Jesus? And how can we be a witness to Christ's death, even when it's not the easiest thing to do? So this is kind of the model of how Mary shows us to be a follower of Jesus. So some teachings on Mary first. Um, so we have this teaching, a dogma, remember central teaching in the church of what's called the Immaculate Conception. Now contrary to popular belief, this does not refer to Jesus' conception. It refers to Mary's conception. And it basically is the belief that Mary at the moment of her conception in Anne's womb uh, was conceived without original sin. So we believe Mary was conceived in the natural human way. Jesus was not. Uh, he was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. However, at the moment of Mary's conception, that stain of original sin that we're usually born with because of Adam and Eve and in our fallen state uh, was, was taken away. And so it's not to say that Mary uh, didn't need a savior. What it means is that uh, God is beyond time and space. So a lot of times we think linearly. A better way to think about how God works is, is like a pond. And just like you drop a, a rock in the middle of that pond, it ripples out in every direction. And so the, the middle of that pond is the crucifixion, the Paschal mystery, Jesus' death that saves. And the effects of Jesus' death ripple out in all time and space. So uh, G Mary simply received the grace of Jesus' cross before it happened in chronological order because it went beyond time and space. So she still needed a savior. She still needed Jesus' grace and Jesus did save Mary in that regard, but she received that grace. She was allowed to receive that grace in her conception. Well, why? So that even the womb, the temple, the ark, if you will, that held Jesus was pure. So not only Jesus was pure, but what held Jesus was pure. So she was being prepared for her role as Jesus' mother. 
Next, we see the, uh, the Annunciation. So the teaching uh, belief of the event that when Mary was chosen to be the mother of God and she did have a choice. And oftentimes Mary is referred to as the spouse of the Holy Spirit. And what that basically is referring to is that she conceived by the Holy Spirit. So she was the daughter of the father, the, mo the mother of the son, and the spouse of the Holy Spirit, in a manner of speaking. So the Immaculate Conception and Annunciation are both feasts in our, our liturgical calendar. The Immaculate Conception is a Holy Day of Obligation on December 8th. And the Annunciation is usually on March 25th, which is nine months before December 25th. Sometimes it gets moved around based on when Lent and Ash Wednesday fall. Uh, but traditionally, if it, it's not uh, conflicted with Lent, it's usually around March 25th. The church also holds a belief in, in Mary's perpetual virginity uh, so that sh her only child uh, was Jesus and that uh, Joseph and her lived chastely. Uh, there's uh, conflicting theories of whether or not Joseph had other children from, uh, from uh, previous marriages uh, or uh, stepchildren per se. Uh, this isn't known. Uh, at times, scripture refers to Jesus' brothers and sisters. This can be an issue of translation that the original Aramaic for brother and sister referred to um, extended family, to cousins, so not necessarily a biological brother and sister, uh, even though the English, we don't really have uh, too good of a translation for that. So you have to remember, scripture was not originally written in English. Uh, it was written in, in Aramaic, Hebrew, Greek. So we have to kind of look at the meaning of those words. So there are different theories out there, but the, the church at least holds that she was a virgin uh, and um, remain that way. And even we see this image in, in uh, scripture earlier on that we believe that she was taken into the temple at a young age to live as a virgin and to uh, uh, be instructed in the ways of the Jewish law uh, and before coming back into the world and, um, and then marrying Joseph. We also see her assumption, so the belief and dogma that at the end of her life, she was taken body and soul into heaven. And that's because her, her body was kept from sin in the state of original sin. She had held Jesus, so she was uh, had already been touched in a profound way. So she was already holy in many uh, uh, great ways. And she was taken body and soul to heaven and where she'll intercede for us to, to Jesus. So ultimately, Jesus, God, is, is who answers any prayers. Mary is, simply asks on our behalf, just like you might ask me for prayers. Uh, Mary asks uh, God for our prayers. We'll look a little bit how that works, maybe with the wedding of Cana in a second. It also kind of foreshadows the fact that our bodies are good. So eventually, our bodies and souls will be united at the end of time, at the last judgment. So simply, what was going to happen to us eventually just happened sooner to Mary because she was without sin, she would go straight to heaven, and, would, and God knew that she was already going to be there. There needed to be no, no specific judgment for her, per se. Lastly, just like Jesus is considered the new Adam, because he, he made up where Adam fell, Mary is considered the new Eve, because just as Eve also fell, Mary said yes to God, and through that yes, Jesus was able to come in salvation. Uh, in fact, the Assumption is also uh, a holy day of obligation. It's usually celebrated on August 15th. Right. Moving on. So so some different titles because this is Mary. So in Mary's mag, what we call the Magnificat, so her response to Elizabeth's greeting in Luke's Gospel, she has this beautiful prayer. Uh, and it's called the Magnificat because Magnificat is the Latin uh, for the first words of her, um, of her prayer, my soul exalts the Lord. Okay. Uh, or magnifies the Lord as a different translation. So she she foretold that because uh, uh, God had chosen her, he will raise her up and she'll be considered blessed by every generation. And she was right. Uh, throughout every generation since then, the church has held a specific place in, in love for Mary as an example of how to follow Jesus. So we might see Mary as in the Greek, the original kind of image of Mary, the Theotokos, the God-bearer, um, that she was the mother of God, as the Immaculate Conception that was conceived without sin. Fun fact, the Immaculate Con Mary, under the title of the Immaculate Conception, is actually the patroness of the United States. Uh, we might see Mary as Queen of Heaven because of the Assumption, or Queen of the Angels. We may see Mary as Seed of Wisdom because of, of 
what God allowed her to experience, to know, to see that she dwelled on all these things in her heart and now sits uh, with Christ in heaven and intercedes for us. There's also many times that the church believes that Mary has appeared in our own time with a message from Jesus. So we might think of Our Lady of Fatima in Fatima, Portugal, where she revealed herself to be Our Lady of the Rosary. We might think of Our Lady of Lourdes in Lourdes, France, uh, where she revealed herself to be the Immaculate Conception. We might think of Our Lady of in uh, Our Lady of Guadalupe, Guadalupe, Mexico, uh, where she also revealed herself as patroness of the unborn, and also of uh, she has become now the patroness of the Americas, North America entirely. Uh, say. So while uh, by technicality, belief in these apparitions are not required of the Catholic faith, the church has kind of lent its approval uh, and popes have visited these locale, locales as kind of a seal of approval that the church has believed these, these are, uh, apparitions are meriting uh, uh, a belief in. And so uh, they're definitely paramount to our belief, definitely paramount to our faith, and that Mary has revealed some great messages through Christ. And it makes sense that Christ would want to continue to, to communicate with us uh, throughout our time. So let's kind of look at a, a specific example of, Mary, of Mary's faith and how she's a model of faith and what this shows about Jesus. Uh, so let's look at the wedding of Cana. So hopefully you'll have read the wedding of Cana and the article kind of reflecting on it, but kind of just a, a one, two, three kind of take on it. So the wedding of Cana is Jesus' first miracle in John's gospel. And uh, in short, Jesus, Mary, and the apostles are invited to this wedding. And at, and at some point in the wedding, the, the wine runs out. And traditionally what happens is, and you'll see this at the end of the passage, they tend to uh, to give really good wine first. And then once everyone's kind of uh, drunk their fill, uh, they give kind of a cheaper wine to not break the bank. And this is because sometimes weddings, you know, today weddings might go for a couple hours. Weddings there could could not only go for hours, but days. It was definitely a communal celebration. And so at some point, the wine runs out. It kind of shows you uh, either the kind of party it was or uh, the fact that maybe the bride and groom couldn't afford as much. And so it would have been seen as a social disgrace or kind of looked down upon that they didn't have enough wine for the whole, for everyone there. So the servant comes to Mary. Interestingly enough, we don't, we don't know why, but Mary finds out about this somehow. Uh, and they don't go directly to Jesus, either uh, because of intimidation or they don't want to disrupt him. But they go to Mary first. And then Mary, believing that Jesus can do something about it, comes to Jesus. And Jesus' response is kind of curious. He goes, woman, which at the time was was uh, uh, a cultural way that was appropriate to responding to to uh, to, uh, to women, to mothers. Uh, Jesus said, woman, uh, what does this have to do with me? And if, if there's any mothers watching this, or if your mom is watching this with you, uh, she might, you know, um, know what that's like, where uh, she might ask you to do something, and and you're like, well, mom, what does this have to do with me? Uh, not right now. And so we still see this very real mother-son relationship between Mary and Jesus, uh, that we kind of forget Jesus was divine, but was also human. And so he goes, Mary, uh, you know, woman, what does this have to do with me? My time hasn't come yet. Ergo, it's not time yet for me to be working miracles or be doing something of this. However, it's so curious because Mary it, like a true mom, so again, if your mom's watching this with you, they might get a kicked out of this. You know, you tell your mom, mom's left to do with me, and your mom tells you to do it anyway. Uh, so Jesus goes to Mary and says, you know, what does that have to do with me? And Mary basically, regardless of what Jesus said, then turns to the servant and says, do whatever he tells you to. So Jesus, you're going to do this anyway. And Jesus listens. And he listens, why? Because if Jesus is love, and we're called to love and honor our parents, of course he's going to honor his mother. If we're called to honor his mother, why wouldn't Jesus honor his mother? And Jesus, of course, has special love and respect for his mother. So he, he did it out of respect for his mother. He even went before when he thought his time was right out of respect and love for his mother. And then we see this this miracle of the water being changed into wine. And uh, it, it said to the passage that this wine Jesus uh, changes becomes the best wine, better than than what they thought the first wine would be. So this is a great image of how kind of Mary works as an intercessor for us, as a, someone who goes to Jesus on our behalf. So of course we can pray to Jesus uh, directly, but sometimes like that servant, we, we might uh, be intimidated, we might be afraid, we might not know where to begin, or we also just want to include other people in the conversation, uh, in our prayer conversation. So think of it this way, just just 
like the servants go to Mary, Mary goes to Jesus, Jesus answers Mary out of respect for her, and then Mary goes back to us and says, do whatever Jesus tells us to. And it's kind of the same way how we believe this process in session when Mary works. We pray to Mary asking for intercession to Jesus. Mary takes our prayers and brings them before her son and then turns back to us and says, now do whatever my son tells you. So in this way, she kind of points us to Jesus. She points us to the person Jesus and helps lead us to Christ. So in this way, that's why Mary holds a very important role within the Catholic Church. It's not that we worship Mary, but that we see the importance of Mary. And if Jesus respected Mary enough to listen to her, that if Jesus loved her enough uh, to respect her, then we should too. And that she should take that important role within that church and within the life of the church. Uh, and for this reason too, the church is seen as a mother, just because Mary also is a mother. And Mary is seen as a patroness of the church. So we can see here also through this miracle that Mary really reveals who Jesus is. That because Mary trusted in Jesus, that Jesus worked this first miracle. So through Mary's kind of intercession, Jesus is shown to be the Son of God, shown to be the Messiah. And so too in our lives, when we pray to Mary, when we ask for intercession, she shows us who Jesus really is. Our Lord and Savior, our God, our Messiah, our friend, and invites us into a relationship with him. So that's what we have for this week's module, uh, and, and I ask you, maybe we can finish together with pr a prayer to Mary and asking for her help. So let's pray together. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen.